I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the very kind invitation. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to open this conference. Uh, thank you so much for, for this. Um, so I'd like to report on some work we've been doing now for a number of years um, in uh, uh, the context of uh, an integrable system which emerges um, when one studies ADS-2 uh, holography and ADS-CFT uh, duality. Uh, and so I, I, I'd like to try to convince you that actually uh, quite a number of surprises emerge in this context. Uh, we started off as a small part of the community delving away from uh, ADS-5, ADS-4, ADS-3. We went down to ADS-2 thinking that it would be quite natural to reproduce the usual story that by then had become familiar and we found a lot of surprises. So I'd like to describe some of them. Um, here's a list of papers. Um, well, um, this was a very old review. Uh, and most of what I'll say is trying to mimic uh, what became a very successful program in ADS-5 and then reproduced further. Uh, but again, as you can see, we've been working at this for quite some time with some wonderful students and collaborators, and we still have, um, uh, we're still finding surprises. So um, before I go into any of the uh, ADS2 related um, parts of this integrability story, I'd like to remind a little bit, uh, very briefly, what the program is about. And effectively, it reproduces what became a very successful procedure in ADS-5 for process 5 in finding the spectrum of the theory um, using integrability techniques, exploiting the fact that the theory has integrability built in. And so let me give a first, um, first an, an overview, a little bit of the main uh, pillars of this procedure, because th this, this is what we will try to do in ADS2, and we'll see how things uh, succeed or fail, uh, depending. So the point is to exploit the beta answers, which is the main uh, tool to address, to solve a spectral problem once you know that the system is quantum integrable. In particular, the picture that one would like to have in mind is that of an integrable spin chain. So if you're familiar with the ADS-5 story, which is dual to n equal four superior mills, you construct composite operators and you put fields at the same point in a trace. And this, uh, in some sense, thanks to the work of Minah and Zarembo, can be pictured as a spin chain. And you try to diagonalize the Hamiltonian of the spin chain. And so here you really take as a starting point Imagine this being a composite operator at the point X in space-time, but we draw it as a state, a cat in the Hilbert space of the spin chain. And the idea is that, well, first you forget that the trace of these composite operators is finite. You imagine you're on an infinite line so that you can use asymptotic states and a scattering matrix theory. And you use the answers of beta, which is you choose a certain reference point. Imagine if you were on a spin chain, of the type of Heisenberg, you would choose, say, spin down as your vacuum state. And then you start flipping up states, one, then two, then three, and you give them some momentum. In this picture, it means that you choose a certain field, say Z, one of the scalars, uh, the complex scalar combination of n equal four superior mills, that you call my um, ground state, my reference state. And every so often in this infinite C of Z fields, I flip up another field. And this represents an excitation which you turn on uh, above the ground state. Some VW, you, depending on the polarization of your fields, you get um, spins in quotation mark because they transform under representation of more complicated groups than SU2. So there'll be some Lee superalgebra governing the excitations. But the idea is always the same, to find an eigenstate, a true eigenstate of the integrable Hamiltonian, you have to give them some momentum. And you imagine, in, for instance, in the two particle state, which means I've flipped two of these excitations, I give them some momentum and the wave function, which looks like this. You see every one of these excitations has momentum P1 and P2, but then there is also a scattering bit with a scalar function in this case, which is just S of P1 
and P2, and then the two excitation of trespasses uh, trespass each other. The fact that I can do this, meaning that the number of excitations is conserved in the process, is again due to integrability. So you can solve the problem in a particle at fixed particle number. And these behave like quasi-particles. They're called magnon if your reference state is ferromagnetic. And they diagonalize the spin chain. Um, and so, of course, you need to find this matrix. Why matrix? Well, in this case, it's just a scalar, but in principle, you can have multiple polarizations. And so when they scatter, they can transfer polarization. So you really have a big matrix that controls how the two excitations go through each other and then reemerge. And so it will be the S matrix of the scattering of magnums. Here's the picture. And this became a very successful program in ADS-5 after this seminal paper, and Beiser, Staudacher, and many other collaborators worked hard to find this S matrix, which, as you can see in this picture, seems to encode the whole dynamical information. Once you found the S matrix, you need to remember that the operator was closed, and so the spin chain, in some sense, is finite, and we could put periodic boundary condition. And so to find the spectrum, you need to write down these beta equations. The beta equations are these. So now in this picture, I've suppressed all the Z fields. I treat them as a vacuum and I just write the excitations as an up arrow. And I put M of them because of course I have sh shown the two particle excitation. I can do three, four, up to M. Uh, in fact, up to the number of sites. And so when I have M excitation, again, this is a closed subsector, I write the beta equation, which are just a periodicity condition of the wave function, the total wave function, will have to satisfy conditions like these. So if you take, for instance, the K magnon, and you imagine to rotate, to make it go through the chain, it will meet all the other magnons, it will scatter off them, you see, some j from 1 to m different from itself. Every time it scatters, it picks up another factor of the S matrix. But in total, the total change should just be a factor e to the i p of the k magnum times the length of the chain, just the periodicity factor. And again, I use over and over this two-body S matrix. The fact that I can, again, factorize the total scattering of the kth magnum with all the other ones in the product is, again, due to integrability, presence of many conserved charges that allow factorization of the scattering. Once you impose these M equations, you see one for each magnum, then you have effectively the quantization of momenta. To understand this, imagine that the S matrix is identity, so no uh, interaction at all, then this is just e to the i p k l equal 1, which is the usual quantization of momenta on a circle. Otherwise, if there is interaction, I get this corrective term, and these become m algebraic equations, which I have to solve, and there's various techniques to solve. But in principle, you've reduced the problem, which is a very complicated dynamical problem of diagonalizing the dil dilatation operator to a set of algebraic equations, which you can put on a computer. Okay, so this program became very successful and we decided to push it forward. Um, but you see, you have to extract somehow the key information, which is this S matrix. It seems that all there is to know about the model is built in this, in this, this matrix so it's a um, matrix value function of the momenta, which is the S matrix. And so let us um, list the properties that this S must have, because in fact, integrability is so powerful that it allows you to fix this S matrix almost axiomatically. Yes, please. Can you say that this is complicated? Yes. 
Why is it complicated? Yes. So the problem is I'm trying to solve it for any number of site n. And so even if it is algebraically well defined, it becomes practically very complicated. So uh, I guess it's then limited by computer power. Um, nowadays, there's a technique called the quantum spectral curve. So the problem actually grows in complexity. I don't really know how to uh, quantify this, but uh, it's not a, a problem that you can just solve in, in closed form. Uh, and also the, the computer will give a list of um, numbers. So to try and understand a little bit more about the physics, um, it is still worthwhile to, to proceed analytically. But yes, in principle, it's just a list of uh, equation which can be put on a computer. The question of efficiency also comes in, um, and that's why people are still trying to develop new techniques. For instance, this QSC, this quantum spectral curve, is the latest. Um, no, unfortunately, I'm not a, a numerical person, but... I, Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. So the question was about how um, is this difficult or complex if it's just one dimensional system and technically the computer can just perform? I think it's a, it's a fair question. So on the one hand, there is a there is a, an issue of effectively extracting information, but this is more of a numerical question. I think what I'm personally interested in is pushing for a system where, um, well, there are, as we will see in ADS2, new ingredients. And so the beta answers will have to be formulated in a certain way. I mean, this is a rather reductive set of equations. If you have... Um, sufficiently complicated least superalgebras governing this, then it's already a problem in representation theory to um, do what is called the nested beta equation. So you have to, um, even just writing down the system, which becomes more complicated than this, um, is, a, is an enterprise on its own right. But so I think it's fair to say that when you reach this point, then yes, you can just feed it to a numerical algorithm. And I don't know, unfortunately, how this would compare with, with efficiency of other methods. For me, the main goal is you give me a sufficiently wild model. Can I write down something like this, which I'm sure encodes the spectrum? Okay. Um, any other questions, please? Feel free to... Right. So, so then the if you're uh, faced with a challenge to come up with an S-matrix that encodes the spectrum, what are the axioms that this S-matrix has to satisfy? And these, again, depend on um, uh, the assumption, which sometimes can then be proven to the best of our knowledge, that the system is integrable. And so here is a sort of little survey of what the exact S-matrix program is, which resonates very much with the axiomatic quantum field theory approach with the old S-matrix program of quantum field theory. And we will see that effectively, um, even though spin chains do not have relativistic invariance, much can be borrowed from the old relativistic S-matrix theory program. So once you know that the theory is integrable, uh, and then of course you are in 2D, one space and one time uh, dimension, then Already with the fact that you have integrability, which means um, more than, so higher conserved quantities beyond the obvious neuter ones, energy and momentum, you have for free certain properties that you can, that we have already exploited initially. You have no particle production and annihilation, and that this was at the basis of the fact that we could restrict to the conserved particle number. Then not only that, but the uh, momenta themselves can only be reshuffled. So you don't have change in the numerical value of the momenta, but the initial and final set are the same. They just permute. And all that changes is the spin, the, the internal degrees of freedom. And as we said, we have factorization. So the M to M magnon process is factorizing the product of two by two scattering. 
at the, at the time. Okay, so all information is in this matrix. How do I determine this matrix in such a way that it is uniquely defined for the model at hand? Well, then I have further axioms for the two-body S matrix. And these you will recognize uh, very much correspond to the relativistic S matrix program. So since they were first uh, written for relativistic system, it's fruitful to just write them in that case where you have a nice parameterization. So if you have two particles, one and two, then I use the fact that now for relativistic invariance, I have this uh, dispersion relation, energy and momentum of the ith particle with mass m is quotient sinh of a certain rapidity variable. And here is very important to notice that m is non-zero. So I'm in the setting for the moment of massive integrable S matrix. Later on, we'll see massless uh, uh, particles and how this changes. So I can effectively write a blob, which is supposed to resum in a field theory picture, all the Feynman graphs of the two into two body scatter. And the, because of relativistic invariance, uh, which would be suitably motiv modified for spin chains, but for the moment, let's assume that we are in this nice situation. Uh, the S matrix just depends on the difference of the rapidities because the boost just adds a constant to the rapidity. So it's actually a function, a matrix valued function of one variable, U, the difference, and I then analytically continue to the complex plane. So I use the power of analyticity in this U variable, which will be complex. The first thing I need to write is braiding unitarity, which is a quantum group property. It's not the unitarity um, of physical theory, which also needs to be satisfied. Uh, that says that the matrix, the S matrix has to be a unitary matrix for real momenta. But this is different. This is a sort of not type relation. It, it means that if I do a scattering and then I undo it, I get nothing. It's again a sort of more algebraic condition. It says S of one and two of U times S of two and one of minus U is identity matrix. So it's one condition, sort of quantum group type. Then I have something that in uh, relativistic theory is crossing symmetry, but it exists also in spin chains. I just need to write it in an appropriate way if I have a charge conjugation property. And it's the usual, if you scatter one and two at the, uh, well, you, you see plates, they're all of an hyperbolic angle now. I can write it as a bit of a, like if it was a trigonometric angle. If I scatter one and two at U, meaning I'm in the S channel, I can read the same through the T channel. And of course, now they form a, an angle I pi minus U, the complementary angle, but in the hyperbolic setting. And so if I turn around 90 degrees, I have this. Of course, this particle from the past has gone into the, sorry, from the future has gone into the past. And so it's anti to charge conjugation. And so in total, these two things should be equal. S of one and two of U is S of anti two one of I pi minus U. And this is quite a powerful relation. Again, these are things that I will use um, a priori to fix my S matrix. Then there's another property, which is the young baxter equation. This is uh, peculiar to integrable systems. And it's the factorization property we were discussing. It just gives it a... Uh, an ambiguous meaning, because you see, if you just say that three particle scattering factorizes and don't specify further, then it's ambiguous, because you can actually factorize it in two different ways, one and two, then one and three, then two and three, or two and three, one and three, and one and two, depends. But Young-Baxter is a consistent condition that sets these two things equal to each other, and it's very powerful, and this somehow is the hallmark of integrability. So this will always have to be satisfied. And again, it's a sort of combinatoric algebraic relation between the entries of the S matrix. And finally, there is also, well, there's another other bells and whistles that you can uh, add, but this one is 
one of the major ones. It's called bootstrap. It's not the conformal bootstrap. Now bootstrap is mentioned in many contexts. This is the integrable bootstrap. And so imagine now that you've analytically continued the S matrix in the complex plane, you may encounter simple poles. And the standard theory wants that if the residue is right, the certain positivity conditions, then it means that there is a bound state exchange. And so let's put ourselves in the situation where these two particles arrive exactly at the difference which forms a bound state. Of course, this is a virtual process, not a real time process. Well, the bound state is a particle in the spectrum. It can itself scatter with any other particle you have. And so in principle, to complete the S-matrix program, you have to compute the scattering again with the bound state with all of them. But the bootstrap is this pictorial, again, bookkeeping device. So if you want to know the S-matrix, this big blob here now, this new blob, with three, which is one of the fundamental particles that you already knew, with the bound state at a certain rapidity angle u, then all you need to do, you don't need to compute again all the axioms. You just pull this line down parallel to itself. And S3b is just the product of S32, S31. So you scatter the components of the bound state. And the angle is fixed by this angle and the bound state angle. So I didn't write it, but you can just write a sort of hyperbolic trigonometric relation between these angles and they're completely fixed. So this picture is completely fixed geometrically. And so you can find the angles at which they should scatter. And so this fusion property allows you to uh, not have to do again all the work to compute the bound state as matrix with the fundamental one. You just split in the components. So this is quite useful. Um, and you continue now, every time you find a new pole, you establish whether the residue is right. And so you find that there's a new particle and you continue the program until you finish, until you don't find a new particle or you find the particle you already had. And that's ended the bootstrap program. So with these ingredients, this is basically the, the end of the little survey on S matrix theory. And we equipped with this idea, we started off going and trying to find, um, to apply this program in all the different cases. So it was uh, very fruitfully put to work in ADS5 process five, and then ADS4 CP3. Uh, we did a lot of work on ADS3, and then we tried on ADS2. And so here, let me just quickly recap what the uh, salient feature were. And so, of course, you have to uh, fix the reference state. You remember the C of Z field that we had. And so effectively, this is done by going to the BMN vacuum and studying the excitations that would be the spin waves or the magnons, um, which you had the V and W. And they are controlled by very particular superalgebras. And here I've listed the superalgebras. You see that they control these excitations. So these ones. They are spin in particular fundamental representations of Lie superalgebras. And what are the Lie superalgebras? Are these. So it depends on the theory you are. And so for ADS5 and ADS4, you have, in fact, two copies of PSU2 slash 2, this particular Lie superalgebra. In three dimension, ADS3 family, you have PSU1 slash 1 left cross PSE1 slash run one right. And again, it depends whether you have one copy or two, whether you're in ADS3, S3, T4, or ADS3, S3, S3, S1, various integrable background. In two dimension, there is either one or two copies of PSE1 slash one, depending on whether you want ADS2, S2, S2, T6, uh, T4, or ADS2, S2, T6. And this particular um, algebra is the, just the kinematic algebra that uh, controls the excitations. 
In all cases, this is one of the universal features of this program, these algebras, which start off without a central extension, you see this PSU, all get a triple central extension. And so this is worthwhile to um, notice. These are very special superalgebras. The PSUN slash N or AN minus one, A minus one in the Katz classification are very peculiar least superalgebras with zero killing form. And these ones admit a triple central extension, which is very unusual. Normally we just have a one dimensional central extension, but in all the cases realized in ADS-CFT, there's three central charges. One is the energy, and other two are sort of complex conjugate to each other and they carry the momentum of the excitation. So in some sense, the physics requires you to have a central element to be able to have a dispersion relation. And so it's quite peculiar that you find all these uh, properties realized. And also it's worthwhile noticing that the isometry group, so before you break the symmetry um, by choosing a vacuum, you have the full isometry group of the theory. That is also of the type with zero killing form. That is for consistency of the string theory. And so there seems to be quite some very interesting representation theoretical properties of the system, which allow a number of things to happen. And so all centrally extended. And for those, again, who are more familiar with this program, they have a remarkable universality of structures. As I said, in all cases, you have a centrally extended superalgebra. In all cases, there is a particular action of the symmetry on multi-particle state. It's called co-product in op algebra language, and it's braided, it's deformed in a very specific way, which is typically of ADS-CFT. There is this very nice um, parameterization in so-called Joukowsky variables, or something that we have discovered and, and I'll introduce later, some pseudo-relativistic variable for the massless representations, which is again a very peculiar, for those who work on that, it's a very particular representation that it works throughout all the examples. And there is various properties which remind us, although they're not exactly like a Youngian, they do remind us of a larger quantum group, which is underlying the theory, which is of a Youngian type. Youngians are infinite dimensional Hopf algebras, quantum groups, and they seem to pop up all the time in amplitudes everywhere in n equals four super young mills. This property most likely is a big, uh, gigantic quantum group underlying the dynamics of the field. What is, yes, please, yes. What do you talk about the Yangian like symmetry? It's not very really like the uh, E algebra, right? No, so, no. What? Okay, the question is, uh, so the Youngian is not a Lie algebra type um, structure, do I have word identities? Uh, there are certain type of identities, the serre relations and multiple serre relations which characterize the Youngian. Um, it's not very easy to realize them because uh, all the charges that are um, associated with higher Youngian levels are non-local. And so from the world sheet point of view, it's really complicated because they're all nested multiple integrals. But in principle, they satisfy several relations, cubic type, which are defining of the Youngian. And, and they, these also get centrally extended, but the structure is very much the same as, as in, in Youngian serre relations. Would the existence of the symmetry constrain correlation functions? The question is whether the existence of the symmetry would constrain correlation functions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't think we are at the stage where we can actually practically use it yet. There are other approaches. Um, I know Kolya Gromov and, and Kings, they have developed something called boot, bootstrability, which is uh, the latest in connecting QSC and correlation function. Uh, and I don't think they still use the full power of the Youngian, but certainly, yeah, this would be a very, very constraining property. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the 
complex but maybe it's this muscle is very important. Ah, that so the question is what the massless modes correspond in ADS-CFT. Yes, that is a, an, an excellent question. In fact, I was just about to say that the new feature in ADS-3 and ADS-2 is the appearance of massless modes. So from the point of view of ADS-CFT, you have flat directions in the background, but I actually don't know whether anybody has been able to um, associate anything on the putative dual CFT. And that is a a big challenge, how these massless modes would be realized in the dual CFT. Um, one thing that is lacking in ADS-3 and ADS-2 is the clear picture of how to work with the dual CFT, what the operators are, how to construct the spectrum. And so I actually don't know what these massless modes would be. Yes. Yes. So the question is, in ADS-5, there is this nice relation between the, the Z field and the excitation with the operators. We do not have that in, in the other examples. So I actually don't know which... So in a sense, I can construct a magnon excitation in ADS-5, and I know that there's a certain operator that diagonalizes the dilatation operator. I wish I had that clear picture also in ADS-3 and ADS-2. I, at, at the moment, yeah, it's neat. Okay, so this point is indeed where we decided to um, es explore more the ADS2 property. So let's actually construct the ADS2 spin chain S matrix. So imagine this now as an application, an exercise, because I've been saying that once you know the representation, the symmetry, and um, effectively that governs or the state transform, I should have in principle no problem applying all the axioms and construct an S matrix. And so let me go through this process to um, highlight also what the difficulties might be and uh, how you get to the point. So in ADS2, we know by kinematics that we need to look at the central extension of this algebra, SE1 slash 1 is, is really small. Let's ignore the squared and just focus on one copy. And for completeness, for future purposes, I will extend it slightly, adding one Cartan element to have GL1 slash 1. It's more appropriate in this way. And so to familiarize myself with this, I first study the non-centrally extended theory, uh, because then it will be just natural to centrally extend. And let me remind something which was, uh, was found in this paper by Gutz, Quella, and Schomerus, representation theory of GL1 slash 1. And so the long, the representations now divide into long and short, or atypical and, sorry, typical and atypical for Lie super algebra. And for the long representation, you have uh, two types, the cuts module, H and mu, these are the Cartan elements and the anti-cuts module, H, bar, uh, H nu bar. They are long, but they're actually very small, the two dimension, because it's GL1 slash one. And so one boson and one fermion. Boson is phi, fermion is psi. H is the central element, which is the anti-commutator of the only two supercharges I have, Q and S. It's central, and B, which is the other Cartan element in GL1, the slash one effectively counts the fermion number, minus one for Q and plus one for S. These are the algebra relations, Q, Q, S, S, nilpotent. And this is the mini representation, which is still long from the Lie superalgebra point of view. Q boson is fermion, S boson zero, and Q fermion zero, S fermion is H, this Cartan eigenvalue boson. And then the B acts, so the, the other Cartan element, which we could call it the hypercharge, just counts again, plus minus for boson and fermion. And I can add a multiple of the identity without spoiling any commutation relation. The other anti-cuts module is 
isomorphic as long as h is different from zero, and it acts in a slightly different way, so the h now is here. But apart from that, again, you can construct the action on states pretty much in the same way. So these are the two, only two possible long representation of this very small superalgebra. Where are the short multiplets? The short multiplets happen at h equals zero. Because if you see at h equals zero, something very nice happens. And so some states are then annihilated by everything. So you see this one, the, the fermion is annihilated by everything. So at h equals zero, the two become short. Well, it means that they, they remain two by two, but they develop a one block, which is a true sub-representation which is this, now I denote him just with n mi nu minus one, which is the fermion. The fermion is the true sub-representation. The two by two matrices become indecomposable. So uh, there's a, you see, there's still a supercharge that sends the other block into psi, and this is this arrow. And so effectively the, the two dimensional representation splits in one plus one, but it's not a direct sum because there's still, an arrow that goes from one to the other, but you don't go back. That's an indecomposable representation. The fermion has become a true sub-representation. It's killed by everything, it's a singlet, and the, and the boson can go into a fermion. So the true short multiplets are these, this, and if you mod out by the fermion, you get the other short representation, which is the boson by itself. This was for the cuts module. If you do it for the anti-cuts, you get something similar. Again, the fermion is annihilated by everything, but there's slightly different uh, numbers and different action. And so it's S now that sends the other block, the boson, into the fermion. So it's still a one plus one in the composable. So it's reducible, but not fully reducible. And we denote it with this arrow between one-dimensional blocks. Once you get to this point, you see that the two indecomposables are not isomorphic anymore. So you get two different splitting. But the short representations effectively are one-dimensional. So even shorter than two, you've got to the minimum possible. The rest is interesting because you start now building the whole representation theory by tensoring together, typically, but uh, something very nice happens. Now, let's go back to the long multiplets. If I tensor two long multiplets in a generic assortment of Cartan element, it's two times two equal two plus two. They split. So the tensor product is always fully reducible. Of course, the H charge sums up and the new charge does something like this, but it's, this is the true direct sum. So I don't go up in dimension except when H1 is minus H2. So when the total central charge H sums up to zero, which is again a sort of shortening point, then I get what's called the projective module. It's a four by four, but it splits into one dimensional short block in this way. So the, the full structure of arrows is one dimensional block goes into a direct sum of to one dimensional block and finally goes into the, the true sub-representation, which is sometimes known as, known as, as the socle of the multiplet. And it's again, these are all one dimensional representations. So I can, I can go up in dimension, of course, just by tensoring, but they all either split or become indecomposable of some fundamental blocks. So I can really just focus on the long and the short, so two and one dimension. The rest is all built, assembled together. And now, okay, this is historically the representation theory of this group. How do I centrally extend? Well, um, the central extension here, I have a comment that, that evade this theorem. Yeah, so in a sense, um, you may wonder, there's a paper by Iohara and Koga that would um, only allow triple central extension in the case of PSU2 slash 2. 
but that is if the algebra was simple. So here is just a comment to say that this is non-simple. PSC1 slash 1 is just the sum of two Borel subalgebra, but it's just a, a side comment. We, let me just show you the central extension. We can explicitly construct it, and here it is. So the triply central extended is this. Now I've populated all the zeros which I had before with different central elements. This used to be called H, now I call it C, or 2C, P and K. And you see the representation is still uh, two-dimensional, boson and fermion, but it's now full. Everything goes into every other element with some number A, B, C, D, which define the representation. The only property I have to close this representation, which is still long, is this condition. But, so for those of you who are familiar with the ADS5 story, this is the first surprise. Typically, when you study the representation of magnons in ADS5 is five, this condition sets this equal to one quarter. So this number M, defined as AD minus PC is quantized to be one. And that corresponds to the mass of the BMN excitation. Here it's not. You can close the algebra however you wish with any choice of these. And so the first thing is uh, that we realized is that in the case of ADS5 as five, you deal with short representation, which was the shortening condition, this equal to one. Here we have to keep the module long. So the, the, the first thing that, that bites us is that we have to deal with long representations and this produces a lot of complication later on because long representations have more parameters and this makes the S matrix program more cumbersome. But apart from that, we can write this still as an M and mimic the uh, features, the parameterization which was uh, found by Bizet et al. in ADS5 and try to reproduce it, at least mimicking um, what was known then. Does this bear any implications in respect of being continuous or discrete? Well, so the question is whether this bears any um, implication on the spectrum being discrete or continuum. Again, this is an excellent question. I think the program is still premature because this is just the spectrum of this auxiliary spin chain, infinitely long. We haven't really gone to the point where we can actually connect to the physical spectrum. If this survives, well, then the question would be, how does this relate to an actual spectrum of the dual CFT? But at the moment, this is just a sort of auxiliary model. So, so the, one could still ask what the, um, where the shortening point is, and it's again at this zero, but it's not zero of P or C actually, before this was H. Now it's the zero of this whole combination. So M equals zero still works as a shortening condition. The module doesn't become one dimensional. So it's a bit tricky what we mean by shortening. It's effectively, um, it develops a combination of charges that kills both states. This is the closest definition we can find to a short module. It's a degeneration point. And it's exactly where these magnons become massless, which is part of the BMN spectrum. So at least we reproduce some sense of the, the BMN excitation. Once we um, establish this, this we, then we can use the parameterization I was mentioning at the beginning. These are these Joukowsky variables which I advertised. There's some special variable which are always uh, uh, recurrent in ADS-CFT. They're very useful and people have developed a lot of technology to study them. And so here too, we just went into the queue and used them as well. They, represent effectively this A, B, C, D in a very favorite form, which makes the dispersion relation look more as a, uh, in, in physical term, it's a sort of a, you see now it starts looking like a dispersion relation, E squared, M squared. And here you can see that this is halfway between a spin chain and a field field. At small momentum, it wants to be a relativistic particle but it's actually quantized on a lattice. So this has a Brillouin zone, and so it's a finite spin chain. So it's this very nice 
uh, representation, which actually, for those who know, is similar to Ising in a magnetic field. So this is not a new uh, function in the theory of integrable systems. And this is, right, the, the parameterization. So that is just to mention it. This is the particular co-product, which I was saying is a hallmark of uh, ADS-CFT. Delta is the symbol which in off algebra is used to denote the action of a symmetry on two particle state. So it acts as a tensor product on particle one and two. And the fact that there's this uh, deformation parameters is again typical of ADS-CFT. And so we just postulate it the same way. It seems to be universal across all uh, dimensions. And so we postulate it. It's a consistent of algebra and we go with it. And so this symmetry, this particular relation is what is practically used to determine the S matrix, at least the um, matrix structure. The matrix structure satisfies uh, the fact that it's invariant. This is a way of saying that it is invariant under the action of the symmetry on two particle state. And as we were discussing before, you can start seeing that it's non-local action. Typically a symmetry, you would like to act like this on two particles. This would be a Leibniz type local action, but now it, when it acts on particle two, it remembers particle one. So it's, you can start seeing the non-locality of these charges. This is still level zero. When you go up in level one, it's even more non-local. So we did this, we write down, now we have the representation. We have the coproduct, plug into Mathematica, and you find the matrix S. Right, and the tensor product, you check that it's still pretty much, but this is just a side comment for um, representation. And here's the form of the S matrix. Now we start to seeing it populate. Mathematica spits out something like this with eight functions. And the first thing you notice is that, again, in the jargon of integrable spin chain, this is an eight vertex model, as opposed to all the other cases where it was at most six vertex. It means that these Qs used to be zero in other dimensions, now they're not. It seems like a small change, it's a dramatic change. This is a one other big surprise of ADS2. You see, the S matrix is a bosonic element, and so, these are really on, the only entries that can be non-zero without violating fermionic number, because you see, you can send two fermion into two fermion, or two fermion into two boson, but you cannot send one fermion, one boson into two fermion. You violate fermionic number. So in principle, these could all be zero, but sometimes these Q are not, if you are lucky, because then you can write a, a six vertex model and it's very well established how to solve them. This is eight vertex. And so it's more complicated, significantly more complicated, but it satisfies something called free fermion condition. So you plug in and a certain quadratic relation between the um, entries, which I'll describe later, happens to be zero. And that is called the free fermion condition in the literature. And it buys you, it buys you some mileage, not, not the whole thing, but it helps you a little bit. But this was not really the biggest problem we found at this stage. The entries as a function of these variables, now everything will depend on these variables, X plus minus for particle one and two, the entries are so complicated that I could not write them uh, on, a, on a page. Uh, Mathematica just gives some monster equation, then you have to massage. Uh, the fact that the representation is long, you don't have shortening condition that kills certain terms, makes it very cumbersome. So I didn't even write them. It's known, we have it in the paper, but it's uh, incredibly it's an order of magnitude of complication. If you just want the analytic form, not, not the numerical development, but the analytic form is just unwieldy and I couldn't do uh, much simplifications. We could still check that it satisfies crossing and unitarity. So it's a perfectly valid S matrix, just explodes on your table and you really don't know what to do. So in the last maybe 10, 10 15, minutes, I will go to a um, 
an escape route because I know that I'm scattering long representation, massive one, and the long, there's a lot of parameter. So what I will do, I will go to the massless point and see whether anything simplifies. So I'll restrict myself to just the massless particle and see whether I can get any luck. So to give you an idea of the complication, it all stems ultimately from, from a function like this. So Mathematica gives you something like this. It's a complicated function with square roots and ratio. It's perfectly well-defined, but it just makes the expression horrible. If you send the mass to zero, these x plus minus degenerate like this. Now you get some sign ambiguity because when you send the massless particle to zero, you have to, and you're on a line, you have to decide whether it's left mover or right mover. Now you get the usual splitting, chiral splitting of massless particle on a left and a right. And here, although the relation, the dispersion relation is non-relativistic, we still pay that price because according to the sign P over two being positive or negative, you get either chiral left or right mover on the world, on, well, on the world line. In this limit, this behaves like a zero over zero with lots of ambiguities, whether you're a plus or a minus for particle one or particle two. So this function f, the gen if you now carefully regularize and take the limit in very peculiar way, you can get very simple results, either plus or minus one, but depending on how you combine left mover with right mover, you get either plus or minus. And so there's a family of limits which split up, but the matrix itself is much simpler. And so you can do a lot of cal calculation just by taking this limit in a careful way. And once you do this limit, you discover that it's actually um, related to an S matrix, which is known in the literature. Uh, it's called Fendley's second N equal one S matrix. These are models with N equal one supersymmetry in one plus one dimension. And so they were known before. Um, it's not exactly the same as I will show you, but it's related. So you start getting to some model that have been analyzed before, and this is sort of reassuring. And this is what it becomes. Those monster expressions collapse tremendously, you just make a, a next uh, step, which is a change of variable, which we found with students um, and collaborators. You go to this gamma variable. You see now everything depends on momentum. You don't need to use this Joukowsky anymore in the massless case. You can just oops, use momentum and you can further change variable in this way when the momentum is positive, zero pi. And everything becomes of difference form and extremely simple. So I just define as theta, the difference of the gamma of particle one minus gamma of particle two. And these are, now of course I have a list because if F goes to plus one, I have one case minus one. And so I get families. And so we call them with lack of creativity, solution three, solution five, one, two in the paper. And so they, they, that this sticks. Uh, up to now, we haven't found a better name. And you see the very simple matrices, full. And I've now put this factor because, of course, this relation never can fix a global factor. But this is actually very important. The global factor contains poles and zeros, which can alter the spectrum. So um, I have to write in principle, different factors that decorate this matrix part, which is however very simple. And at this point, we could actually make progress and study these matrices. So that's what we did. We actually fixed the factor. So here probably is, is good to come back to the question which was raised, where is the complication? Well, if you proceed analytically, then you have to find this factor satisfying all the properties, unitarity, braiding unitarity, crossing. Jan Baxter is fixed, we checked. That depends only on the matrix structure. But the what's called the dressing factor is quite a complicated function. And so it turns out that this is the expression that we get to solve 
all the relation in this particular case. So for instance, the crossing symmetry boils down to this relation. It's very simple, but still finding the solution is not trivial and the exact analytic, analytic solution is found recursively as a product. And omega-5, the other one turns out to be related to omega-3, and they satisfy this strange braiding unitarity. So this one is, is bizarre. We, it took us a long time to understand. This is not the one I wrote at the beginning. It's a mixed one between two different solutions, but we have an explanation for that. But this, you see, it gives an idea of how the problem analytically becomes very complicated. And so it, I, I believe it will be very hard to guess numerically the analytic completion of a set of numbers. Yes. Ah, whether there are CDD ambiguities. That's a, an excellent question. So a CDD ambiguity is a particular function which solves these two equations, but maybe not this one, but the proper braiding unitarity with one on the right hand side. So they're homogeneous solution. You can always put them in. Well, uh, we don't know the true spectrum. So at this point, we're not able to fix them, but with this choice, so no CDD here, we match Fendley's uh, second S matrix. So we, we decided to keep the, 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 the that. Okay, so this form then can further be transformed in an integral form. So what you do, you use the what's called the Malmsteen representation of the gamma function is a particular integral representation. You plug it in here, the product become a sum because it's e to the integral. And so you can write an integral representation in a certain domain. So this is certainly the analytic continuation everywhere. You can prove that this formula defines a meromorphic function everywhere with poles only on the imaginary axis, uh, but otherwise it's completely well-defined. This formula, of course, will have a domain of convergence. And then you effectively analytically continue with the previous expression. Right. And so here we could actually, once we got to this formula and we could check that it satisfies all the relation, we could make sense of why this particular strange braiding unitarity, which was not what we expected. And it's um, because of this splitting. So what we did with students recently, we managed to show that if, so the, the spendly second S matrix also comes in different flavors. There's a parameter P, which you could choose one half or minus three half. So that's just a particular uh, feature of the n equals uh, one theory. Our S matrix um, is the limit at large theta, plus or minus infinity, of those friendly S matrices in different combination. And so, of course, the friendly S matrix satisfies a proper unitarity, which is S of theta, S minus theta is one. But if you take theta to infinity, you go to different limits. And so that's why we get solution three times solution five equal to one. So th there's a simple reason that it's just a limit of another integrable system. So this somehow is built in from the fact that these two are different asymptotic limit of the same S matrix. So this was satisfying to, to show that we were not going completely mad. Thank you. Okay, so once we have this, we can claim that we have effectively um, found the S matrix and we can start the beta ansatz uh, analytically. And so I think, well, for my capabilities, there's no way I can actually solve the beta equation when the S matrix is this. So this could be another point where we could, again, discuss or find ways in, in, in which the computer can actually find, uh, can actually help solving these type of equations. But what we have done, let me effectively just briefly skip over this. Well, we've managed to find in the literature a, a known procedure for solving the uh, algebraic beta ansatz, well, for bypassing the algebraic beta ansatz 
four S matrices of eight vertex type. This was developed by Felderhof, Zamologico, and also uh, Changrin Han. Uh, and they, so this I, I probably should say, the fact that it is eight vertex means that I cannot actually choose the reference state as we described at the beginning. There's no highest weight state that would do uh, the job of the Z field. And so we have to find a way around. And the next slides, which I'm just gonna fly over, are, are us repeating what was discovered in the case of um, the free fermion model, which our model satisfies. So it's a relation that also our model satisfies. In that case, an ad hoc technique was developed to find the um, set of beta equations. So we just apply that. And so if you if you want, you can read in, in, the, paper, in the paper or here, I'll, I'll give the slides. Um, but in the end, we found the set of beta equations as the zeros of particular transfer matrices, which is a sort of procedure that's in this old literature. So let me just conclude by advertising some of the, uh, right, of the latest work we've been doing. I was hoping to be able to report on some progress on, uh, we'll be doing with student at Surrey, but progress has been slow. So I hope in the near future to report on that too. But for the moment, we actually exploited some more of the free fermion description with people, good friends in Dublin. We, um, wrote paper and showed that actually this free fermion description is quite universal in ADS-CFT. Uh, we studied form factors, which is a first step towards correlation function, again, with enormous complications. So we had to use some old Musardo trick and the Martino Morricone technique because everything seems to be unconventional. And also we studied deformation with um, some collaborators. And so we have future directions, and it's also an invitation to uh, join. We are a small enterprise in this. Uh, the community has split, it's become quite small, so uh, good forces are requested, but uh, I hope that we will have some progress uh, very soon. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. We have uh, further questions. Thanks. Can you say elaborate a little bit more on what it would require to solve in this? So you, in the end, you had difficult equations. You said what would be required. Yes. So effectively. Is there a way I could write, uh, just sketch on a, ah. ah, yes. So typically once you found, oops, the scalar factor, how can I erase this? Ah, ah, yes. So, Because I know the type of algebra, so the Dinkin diagram, I already can write the beta equation. And so I'll have something like KL equal product J different from K. This monster factor of theta J minus theta K and some trigonometric function Two. This will be called momentum carrying equation, but that is a, there's a constraint because the algebra has a um, further roots, and so there's some uh, from n, and there's a cotangent of something theta minus theta n over two. This ah sorry, uh, so there is product some other product. Uh, okay, I'm getting this wrong, but there's some, so K is here. And from one to M, and this is for N, M, and this is K 
one to capital N, something like this. So I need to solve this for any N and M arbitrarily large. And this is, is the killer because this is given in terms of these gamma functions. And so I am actually a very bad numerical person, even just in mathematical, which is probably not the best way, even just coding this so that it gives a number is, is impossible to me because uh, it tells me the series uh, has no precision. So I'm, I'm just very bad at this. But in principle, you have to find this for any N and M. What people do often is to push this at the thermodynamic limit where these becomes infinite. Well, you go to the logarithmic version, become integral, and then you have the, the TDA, the so-called thermodynamic beta answer. So, but in, ma in massless case, somehow it's m equals zero. All usual corrections are here. So, what's the what's the role of bad answers in this case? Okay, that's which a, you wrote. That's an excellent question. So, what I'm writing here is really only valid for capturing the massive sector. Uh, in the asymptotic limit of large L, ignoring wrapping correction. But that's, of course, only valid. That's never true. So effectively, when you have massless modes, you will always have corrections to this, which come at arbitrary um, L. So you never have exponentially suppressed. So in some sense, this is just the... If the theory was only massive, this would be all I have to do. But then... Otherwise, I need to go to the massless TBA and keep all the exponential correction. That's absolutely true. So this would be modified already by, by the massless mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question was, does it capture some um, physics at m equals zero? So, so it could be that for some consider... So one thing that I've noticed in the massless literature is that often, even though you don't expect suppression uh, because of the mass equals zero, Somehow numerically, you still have a distinguishable suppression of the eye of the term that wouldn't need to be, but they are. In the form factor literature, it's very clear. Sometimes you can truncate, even if you have no a priori reason to do it, it still approximates well. So the hope is that the theory is robust enough to just self cut off, self regulate in some way, but it's pure hope. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. And, and another small, small question. So when you did that uh, central extension for two copies of algebras, so it, it was uh, the same parameters for central yes. extension, of course, yeah. right? So just because it looks symmetric, but uh, so is there some, I don't know, some natural deformation which one can make such that uh, it will be reasonable to have different uh, extensions for left and right? I think there would be, and in fact, in the recent in a recent paper by Marius Delow and the Dublin group, they have found an interpolating S matrix between ADS3 and ADS2 with extra parameter. And they study the algebra. I don't know whether they can identify exactly whether more central charges, so different central charges between the two copies. I'm not quite sure, but in principle, yes, there, there, there is no, no limited at the deformation. So technically you could, you could, the two copies could be independent. Um. Okay, uh, in view of the time, I suggest we thank the speaker again.